Hi everyone, it's Denise Brown from the Caregiving Years Training Academy. Thanks so much for joining us for our fourth event in a series that really speaks to how do we heal after the holidays. And today we're gonna to have a panel discussion and those of you who are joining us live, I welcome you to add your own answers to the questions that I pose to the presenters in our chat room. And if you have any questions for us around healing after the holidays, feel free to also pose those those questions in our chat room. So let me tell you about the presenters who are joining us today. You'll know some of them because they presented during this week. So Kathy's joining us and Kathy cared for her mom and a dear friend. And she presented yesterday and gave us an idea about how do we take a break from grieving. So welcome, Kathy, great to have you back. Thank you, Denise. Thanks to everyone for being here. Yeah, Melinda's joining us. She was part of our event in November and she cared for her father. And so she is really giving us insights on how she helped not only her family heal through grieving, but especially her son who was young when her father died. So Melinda, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, thanks for having me. And then Emily's here. Emily, if you wanna unmute yourself, then I'll find you. So Hello. hi, Emily. Yeah. Hi. So thanks for being with us today, Emily. So Emily was one of our presenters and she shared really helpful rituals around forgiveness, which is such an important part of healing. And Emily cares for her partner. So Emily, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me, Denise. Okay, so let's start with our first question. And I thought it would be helpful to start with a review of the holidays for the three of you. When we gathered in November, we talked about our plans for the holidays. And I'm just curious, when you reflect on your holidays, any worries or regrets around how you celebrated and the rituals that you actually defaulted to given the circumstances around how we could celebrate this past year? And I'll throw it out to anyone who wants to start. I'll, I'll go ahead and start, oh, if that's okay. Um, yes. We really, um, I feel like we really failed on the holidays. <laughs> uh, we, uh, you know, we basically, you know, we didn't do the things we usually do as a family. Uh, and we've planned a few things to make up for that, like getting uh, meals out, that kind of thing, get, getting meals, picking up meals out. But we didn't really do any activities because there weren't really any activities to do. And it was a really hard time, I thought, for, for all of us. And it's interesting because for many years I said, oh, we weren't doing our usual holiday celebration. I do this, this, or this, but none of those other things were options. So, you know, I felt like it was a really, it was a really, um, it was a hard time for uh, our family, I felt. I hope we're not doing this again next year. <laughs> yes, I know. It was hard and, um... I hope I'm pronouncing your first name correctly. Renee is sharing in the chat room that she also put her traditions on hold. And I wondered, Emily, how the holidays for, were for you as you look back on them? Um, I think, well, I think one, the holidays changed a lot around three years ago after my husband's injury. And then we are kind of already, you know, adjusting and adjusted and, you know, so I think the holidays have been different for the last few years, but we were finding new kind of traditions or finding ways to do old traditions, you know, and reincorporate. And then when COVID hit, that kind of all got, you know, it's like the slate got wiped clean again, kind of like start over, you know? And um, I think, I think we've, I think we did pretty well at kind of surrendering to the reality of the situation long in advance. So I don't think we were as disappointed as we would have been if we had had our hopes up really high that we were going to be able to get together. Like I think a lot early on, we sort of read the writing on the wall or however the saying goes, and we kind of had a feeling that we weren't going to be really seeing anyone in 2020. Um, and so I think we were able to come to more of a place of acceptance, I guess, um, earlier on. I, we did miss having you know family dinner with. Um, like my uncle and his partner, um, since we'd done like a smaller family dinner the last couple of years. Um, and so, you know, it was sad not seeing them and not having that tradition, but we did, um, 
have dinner with my parents. We live with my parents in an attached sort of detached studio from their house. So, you know, we went across the <laughs> little walkway deck to my parents' house and, um, you know, my mom cooked dinner and they had their little tree and stuff. And so there still was, um, you know, some Christmas spirit. We did still have a bonfire on Christmas Eve, which I think is one of the most kind of the longest running traditions. I think my parents have had this bonfire on Christmas Eve um, in the backyard every Christmas Eve for my entire life. Um, and we used to have people come over, you know, and, um, and, and hang out with us. But this year, um, my parents were just sitting out by the fire. And then um, my husband, it's too cold. He's really temperature sensitive. So he can't go outside in the cold. So um, I would just go out to the fire for a little bit and come back in or my parents would come and hang out and check on him. And then, you know, I'd go back because I didn't want him to feel left out either. So I was able to find balance and sit by the fire outside for a little bit and also, um, you know, spend time inside with my husband. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. We didn't do a bunch of, you know, a lot of presents um, this year and we just kept it pretty low key. Um, and yeah. Melinda, how about for you? Um, for us, it was, um... It was, it went okay, I would say. Um, we, Christmas Eve is usually our big um, kind of, you know, time for Christmas where we, we always do the same thing. Um, Christmas day, our plans like sometimes vary, but Christmas Eve, we always make the same meal. Um, we usually host friends at our house and obviously this year that couldn't happen, but we decided to make the meal anyway, just for, um, just for ourselves and our little um, family. And actually I would say this year, was it was the first time that we timed everything to where all the food was ready at the same time, which we were just uh, astounded by and very uh, thankful for. So um, it seemed like there was like a little bit of you know magic happening with that, which was nice. Um, so we were we were able to enjoy that, and then our um, our Christmas day was um, you know pretty relaxed and quiet um, and you know, my son is 10. And so, you know, of course it's, he's getting his Lego sets and, and building his Lego sets and, um, you know, uh, enjoying the day. And so, um, yeah, overall, I would say it was, it was hard not to see friends. We don't live near family, so we don't typically see family unless we're traveling for the holidays. Um, but to, to not have any kind of like socialization with friends was, was a little bit tough, but, um, as Emily said, it was kind of, we were expecting that, you know, it wasn't like the night, <clears throat> excuse me, the night before it, we were like, you know, scrambling to be like, oh, we can't see our friends. It's like, we knew it was coming. So um, we were able to just kind of lean into it and um, and know that we were gonna have a quiet day and, and kind of, you know, prepare for that. So overall, I think it went okay. Something that Emily said made me think about how much we adjusted in 2020. And I wonder if you have felt a fatigue around adjusting. I would say yes. I think there's a um, there's kind of like a special level of exhaustion um, that has happened uh, that I've experienced. I would say, um, you know, I, I keep thinking about how. Um, this all started like in the middle of March last year and we're coming up on the one year mark of living this way that we've been living and that's just astounding to me that it's been that long. Um, so yeah, I would say that especially around the holidays and um, you know, I've shared before that um, my father passed away on December 20th. So that's like a really tough part of, of the holidays in general. And so to, to add on to that, like all of the, the changes that we had to make and adjustments because of COVID, um, it did kind of make everything feel a little bit heavier um, because there was this extra layer added on top of it. Um, so yeah, and we've had some kind of other family stuff that's gone on as well um, during this time. So like within the past six months or so. So that's another kind of just uh, addition to, to it. Um, so yeah, I would say that definitely factored in for me personally, yeah. Kathy, how about for you? I'm definitely feeling that there's a lot of exhaustion, a lot of community exhaustion about the whole thing and a lot of personal exhaustion about it. And, and like Melinda said, you know, I just looked at the calendar and thought, oh my gosh, it's almost March again. And here we are having done this for a year. And it, it's really, uh, it, it's, 
it, you would think by now we would be in a routine about it, but instead it just feels like it's more and more and more and more. I think part of the reason it's been hard to get into a routine about it is information about our circumstances continues to change. So we heard about the vaccines and it was like, yes. And now the struggle is, well, how do we get one? And so it doesn't seem like there's really this organized delivery of information about how to get one. So we talked to my parents about how do we get one? They talked to their doctor, their palliative care nurse, who said, talk to your home health nurse. So it feels like there's always a referral to someone, which during caregiving, for those of you who are currently caring for someone in the family, you kind of get so tired of just the referrals. You just want to connect with someone who's got the information so that you don't have to keep asking. Emily, how about for you with adjusting and any fatigue around it? I feel like I have days where um, I feel pretty, like I've adjusted pretty well and I've really kind of surrendered to my reality um, because resisting it like doesn't feel good. And so I think I've, I've been able to kind of get to that place, but then there are days where um, I think that that fatigue does kind of hit on a deeper level for sure. Um, and I think like not being able to see my friends is like a really hard one because even um, before COVID, I was, you know, I would see them maybe, you know, do something really fun with them, like once a month, you know, I would kind of try to plan something where I would get away for, you know, half the day or the whole day and um, go spend time with friends. And that was a really, you know, important part of my own respite care and also going to school. So I started going back to graduate school um, last year. And so I was going in person to classes. And um, that was a really big deal for me, too, because just speaking in a, like a classroom setting after being kind of removed from my regular life for a few years and like living in a hospital and like the only people I really talked to were like medical doctors and healthcare workers and stuff and like you know some friends and family but it was just like a kind of a shock to the system to be in spaces to even say like hi my name is Emily and and I had lost all of my titles all my work titles like I didn't know how to introduce myself anymore and um so that was really I'm grateful that I had a period of time between like when my husband's injury and COVID where I was able to kind of um, return to public life in a way. I'm really grateful that I had a period of time at least and it didn't go straight from intense recovery to COVID without me ever having been able to do that. Um, but I feel like it is really like bittersweet and there's hard moments when like there are friends that I would really love to see, even if it, like I had been able to accept like, okay, I can only see them once a month. Um, and then to have that taken away too, I think is really hard. Um, but we do have regular um, Zoom calls and circles, kind of like um, healing circles weekly, every Monday with a group of women, um, some of whom are close friends of mine for years and some of whom I met through this space, through friends of friends. Um, but we have been meeting now for, um, since March, every Monday, um, every Monday evening. And so that has been really healing um, and powerful space for me to both share and get things like that I need to get off of my chest and be able to release um, and also to build that community um, during these really hard times when we can't meet in person. So you touched on something that is on my list of questions and I'm gonna jump ahead to that. And that is secondary losses that happen after a major loss. So Emily, you talked about a major loss for you and your husband, which changed your titles. And mm -hmm. we are very title driven <laughs> in our society. And if there's been a loss, a death, there could be a loss of a title, so to speak. So it could be the loss of the title of family caregiver. So if you were caring for someone who died, all of a sudden that role is no longer a part of your identity and even if you didn't use the term family caregiver, you're still describing your days in a different way. Your story has changed. And I think about the change of story as a secondary loss is something that ne doesn't necessarily get a lot of attention. So I'm curious when you think about your secondary losses, and again, whoever would like to go first, I'm wondering, was there one part of your story, one part of your identity that you really grieved for after a loss? I can um, follow up. So 
I think, um, so two things that come to mind. One is my, I feel like my work identity was a huge part of my life. My life sort of revolved around um, community organizing work. I was a policy and resource director, um, working with young people, doing this, you know, I was, and I, I was probably a workaholic and working too much. So I was very like, it's just like my whole life was very much centered around this organization and the work and the movement and the people. And, um, and so to have that, like, take, like to be sort of ripped out of that environment and out of that role and out of those relationships so suddenly, um, you know, and, and never, you know, going back into that role um, was really hard to adjust to, um, not just kind of for my work, but for the people and the young, like the youth that I was working with. And, you know, it was really meaningful work to me. Um, and so even though I'd wanted to find more balance kind of, you know, in my life, um, I, it like everything was just sort of taken away so suddenly and abruptly that that was really hard. Um, and then I think the other thing is the loss of being able to travel. And so I think it's like, there was a few weeks ago where my phone, like, you know, iPhones these days, like it curated all these photos from my phone of like ocean pictures. And it had our, my husband and I, our honeymoon um, pictures. And then when we went to Cancun a few years, um, like five years ago. And so seeing like those pictures of us, like in those spaces and my husband being able-bodied and able to just stand, like standing side by side or playing in the ocean, like are really bittersweet to look at. And so it's hard to look at those memories and to like feel the like all of the changes and like the loss that's happened and not being able to travel or um, if we even were able to travel it's just a lot more logistics and work and I mean there's just so much more that would go into it and it's not sort of that carefree like you know literally like it sounds cliche but like being able to like walk on the beach you know is not something that we can ever do again so being able to like cherish those memories and value those pictures um, and to look at them without it like sort of pulling me into like a deep grief, but being able to look at them with gratitude for like the experiences that we were, that we did have the privilege to be able to have together before um, and to really cherish those memories. But it is there, it is hard to look at those too. Just to follow up for you, Emily, what happened to you was a surprise to look mm -hmm. at your phone <laughs> and have memories show up. Mm -hmm. It was out of your control. And I think yeah. that can happen, which makes it even harder because that requires an energy to, to pull up and say, okay, this happened and I'm having a reaction to it. Mm -hmm. How do you manage these shocks that really could trip you up in a significant way? I think, yeah, I mean, it kind of feels like a punch to the gut or something of like, oh, well, it like kind of stops me in my tracks. Like, oh, wow. Um, and I think I had to like sort of take a moment and like take a deep breath to prepare myself to like look through them. And then I went to like um, to look at them alone. Um, so either like in this little, I turned my closet into like a little tiny micro office or like into the bathroom. And um, because I wasn't sure how um, my husband seeing those pictures would feel also. So I was like also concerned about how it would make him feel, if it would make him feel really depressed and like trigger his depression around his injury. Um, so it was something that I wanted to look at them alone um, and, you know, just really allow myself to kind of go into that place, like to revisit those memories and to like look at the pictures that are painful and to like see the pictures of us standing side by side and knowing that he can't stand. Um, so he's paralyzed. He dove into a lake on vacation um, three, three and a half years ago um, and hit his head on the bottom of the lake and became paralyzed. Um, and so, yeah, so that, I think just preparing myself, taking a moment alone to really go and, and look at those images or to little, watch the little video clips. And then um, I've asked him like if he wants to see them or look at them and um, you know, or like just letting him know when he's ready or when he wants to that they exist and that we can look at them, um, but not wanting to like push that on him unexpectedly or without warning um, because it could like trigger his depression. And so it just depends on the state of mind kind of that he's in, whether he like, wants to see pictures like that or not. Um. Something that you also touched on is that a loss doesn't return us to what was, meaning that you got a call at work and then you went to the hospital and you never went back to work. Mm -hmm. And I think about that with our carries. So my parents are 89 and 86. 
my mom had a critical illness in July of 2015. On a, on a Saturday, she was transferred to the emergency room. That previous Monday, she had been a volunteer in that hospital. She never returned as a volunteer. And I think about these kinds of losses where you don't return, but there's no ritual, there's no closure to it. It is a stop, an immediate stop. And that's hard. And I wonder about what do we, there's nothing in place to help manage those significant stops. And so we have to figure it out. Melinda, I saw you really shaking your head. So tell me about how that is resonating with you and what your experience has been. Um, it, well, it's just, it's really interesting that you, you bring that up and you, you know, kind of acknowledge that because it's, you're right. It's some, something that's not really, I feel like addressed, um, you know, just kind of like in society in general, uh, much like, you know, a lot of stuff related to grief and caregiving is kind of like, it's not really yet, you know, I don't know. I don't, I feel like it doesn't all have it, the place that it deserves in the way we talk about these things in, in a lot of different um, cultures. But um, yeah, I mean, for me, like I, it's funny you mentioned like those days and stuff. Like I remember the day that my father called me and said that he had a brain tumor. Like I, I know the date, I know what day of the week it was. I know where I was, you know, it was like, that was the moment that I, even though I wasn't yet like actively caring for him, I, my role changed so drastically from like, that's my dad and I'm his daughter. And like, this is our relationship and we're both healthy and everything's fine to like, my father has a terminal illness and I need to care for him. Um, and so to think about the idea of not being able to return to what was before, um, I think is, um, it's interesting, especially in grief, I feel like, because, you know, if we feel like we've, we've changed, sometimes it's kind of like, we want to go back to what was before, because it's, you know, we feel like it might ease the pain somehow. Um, and I definitely feel like in the first year that I was grieving my father's death, I felt like I was a different person. But after that first year, I really did start to feel like, okay, actually underneath, I'm still the same person that I always was, but I have changed in some ways based on this experience. So it's not like, I, like I'm in an entirely different, part. there's no like, you know, traces of the, the pre, you know, caregiving experience me in the version of myself that I am today. There's, um, th I'm still the same person that I was before, but there are things that have changed. So it's not like this complete, like 100% transformation. Um, but it did take me a long time to get back to that place where I would feel more like the per a little bit more like the person I was and like being able to connect to the person that I was before that experience. Um, if that makes sense, <laughs> that was kind of what was resonating with me. Well, what, what occurred to me is that there's a stop to the reality of your life and then there's a stop in some regard to who you are as a person. And yet we have these stops which are significant in our life and there's no time to acknowledge and grieve because you are called to act. Mm -hmm. So you just keep going. It's something that Kathy and I have experienced in our grieving support group that we co-facilitate is the attendance of those who have had a significant loss years ago and are now finding that they have to, they have to deal with it. That they, they pushed through the loss for years and now not sleeping at night, for instance, for eight years, which is someone who attended our group on Tuesday talked about is not acceptable. So it is almost like the pain is too much. I've got to do something with the pain. But yet in that moment, there's no one to help us with that pain because we're called, right? We're called to act. Kathy, what do you think about these sudden stops in our life and how do we cope with those significant changes? Well, it's interesting when, when um, one of the things I was thinking about is something that really changed culturally for me and, and a lot of the people who knew the friend that um, I lost, that we all lost because one of the traditions was going to live music together. So going to concerts together. 
So there was the whole preparation for getting ready to go and the excitement about getting ready to go and the going part and the hanging out together. And there are a group of us, myself included, that have not been able to go to live music since then. Like it's just been too painful. I mean, I will say that I'm, I'm starting to, but I have to be really careful because I'll react really strongly, but I have friends who still, still will not go. On the other hand, some other friends started right back in and started going. And so there's like this chasm between us where there are the, you know, some people are able to cope with it because doing that again is a comfort to them. And for some of us, it's just too painful. So it was an interesting and abrupt change and it's something I've done all my life. And suddenly it's like, but it hurts to do that sometimes. So it's, an, it's, it's really interesting. It's interesting how the two groups of people interact too, because there's, you know, some of the people who got right back into the swing of things are going, I don't understand why you can't. And some of the people who can't are going, I don't understand how you can, you know? So it's, it's a very, it's interesting to see how different people react to different things. Yes, and how, how you look at yourself as a music lover in a different mm -hmm. way now. So mm -hmm. something that brought you a great deal of company, the company of others, and enjoyment now has shifted for you. Right. Something I think about is the tasks that we have to do as part of our daily life that are in many ways connected to a memory of what we lost. So for instance, Barbara, who's one of our participants in our Certified Caregiving Consultant Training Program, couldn't go to the grocery store for a year because grocery shopping was too painful. When she was caring for her husband, those trips to the grocery store were about trying to find something for him. So there was this urgent need to find nourishment for him. That was what was her focus when she went to the grocery store. And to have that loss and that lo loss of purpose in going to the grocery store was significant for her. So it took her a year to come up with a way to do it, which was, she said, just go in for 10 minutes and then come out. So it was that little step that allowed her to get used to it and to figure out, well, what am I doing here? Why would I come here if I don't come to feed my husband? So there's also a shift in how we look at our tasks which for others are mundane, right? <laughs> Everybody else is walking into the grocery store with their to-do list and not thinking anything of it. And I think about grocery stores as really the significant place of grieving, but yet there's no place to grieve in a grocery store or in a Walgreens, right? Because caregiving is all about going to the Walgreens to get supplies and, and pharmacy. So what do you guys think about those kinds of tasks and which tasks for you were difficult after a loss? I think for me, grocery shopping initially, like when my husband had first kind of, like, kind of come home from the hospital um, or even I think I went to Trader Joe's a few times, like a couple times down the street from the hospital to get things to bring back and to have there that I could like snacks and stuff. And um, I felt like initially that like I was walking around with like a giant like poster board sign on my head that said like my husband dove in a lake and broke his neck and I was trying to court injury and I'm hella traumatized and I look like a zombie and everyone must know that I like look you know like but then like everyone else is just going about their day like oh cleared you know like and I'm like experiencing this immense shock and trauma of like this thing that happened and then so making small talk you know like oh how are you you're like like oh you <laughs> like you know and so it's like do you like I can't be like unleash this whole story on this like poor cashier you know like how am I like oh well, let me tell you how horrible I am you know so it's just like being able to say like and I couldn't say like I'm like I couldn't even lie and say like good or fine or just something either so it was like a really hard to have those small inner interactions at first and like, like I said like I just felt like everyone I felt like I don't know like everyone could both knew and didn't know at the same time in really weird ways. Um, and then I think after a while, grocery shopping was something that was like one of the small things that I got to like leave my house to go do. And like, it was like a nice break and it was like fun to go walk around the grocery store and like um, 
one time I met one of my friends who has two small kids and she doesn't get out of the house much either. And so like we met at the grocery store for a little while. And, um, and so, you know, I would go to my exercise class and then I would stop at the grocery store on the way home. Um, and so that kind of be, was becoming part of my routine. And then when COVID hit in March, um, I stopped going to grocery stores. And so I haven't been inside of the store since March. Um, so I feel like it would feel very strange now um, to kind of go back into that environment again of being in a store. Um, but yeah, sometimes those very sort of simple life things like can have a lot of really funny feelings associated uh, with them. And then running into people, I was always like anxious that I was going to run into people I knew. And like, I felt so self-conscious, like, cause I felt like I just like looked like a zombie cause I was so exhausted and it was like, so like just, and, and I also didn't know how to have those conversations. And so I was afraid to like run into who know, you know, whoever at the store and say like, hi, how are you? And not be knowing how to even engage in that kind of small talk at that point in my life, so. We do an event called Our Big Ideas where we present a big idea and then we hear feedback about it. And, and during one of our conversations, I, I wondered if there should be a, gro a grieving space in a grocery store. So that if you're going down an aisle and it's the aisle that brings back a lot of memories, you have a place where you could go for a few minutes to collect yourself, but in private, so you don't feel like your grief is on display. I think there's some logistics around that and I can't decide if it's a good idea with COVID because I think about you're crying in the grocery store, which feels so vulnerable and you just want to go to a place to collect yourself. But where do we go in a grocery store during a pandemic to take our mask off? and wipe our tears. I'm not sure of the logistics of it, but I'm not gonna give up. <laughs> Cause I think also maybe there's a volunteer that could sit with you for a few minutes. You know, we think about reaching family caregivers and former family caregivers and why not go to where they are? And they're at the grocery store and they're having a hard time in the grocery store and in the pharmacy. Melinda or Kathy, what would you guys add? Yeah, I was just gonna say um, since my caregiving experience was a little bit different because it wasn't where I live. Like I had to travel back to my hometown. Um, so, but I do think about this a lot because my sister still lives in my hometown. And I think about, I mean, in general, our experiences of grief are very different. We're totally different people. Um, but she drives around that town every day and sees reminders of, you know, places that we used to, you know, take my dad for his doctor's appointments or, um, you know, even driving, you know, to his house, you know, where my mom li still lives. It's like, there, there's so much to be like reminded of physically in the space, whereas I don't have that experience. I, my dad spent about a month out here in LA um, with me while he was sick and I was caring for him, but it wasn't like that kind of extended period, you know, I, you know, obviously I have memories of that time and, and doing things in places that we went. Um, but it feels a little bit different because it wasn't like a, in the kind of day to day of my regular life that I've been living here for years and years and years, like my sister's been there for many, many years. And so, and she shops at the same store and, you know, everything like that. So I do think about the, how different it must feel for her to still be kind of in that same environment. Um, and my dad had a lot of friends. So I imagine like as Emily was saying, like running into people, I imagine my sister probably runs into, you know, some of my dad's friends, maybe, you know, in town or something. Um, so, so that's probably like a little bit difficult for her um, as well. But I don't have in the day to day, I don't necessarily have that kind of experience. I will say like traveling after um, I, you know, after he passed away, like, especially traveling back to Connecticut to, you know, see the rest of my family, um, that was definitely difficult. And obviously I haven't done it um, since the, since the pandemic started, but, um, but yeah, back, you know, a couple of years ago when I would, when I would go back to Connecticut, even just like the getting on the plane and, you know, just kind of doing all of the, the logistics related to travel would kind of bring me back to like all of those flights I had to take going back and forth to see him and then come back here and be with my family. Like that was kind of the thing that, um, yeah, kind of uh, was challenging for me. 
Kathy, what would you add? I was trying to think of something um, that would be relevant. Oh, I just want to say about your grocery store idea, though. A piece of music on the music once sent me out of the store in tears, so I totally support your idea. <laughs> um, um, I'm just trying to think of, you know, we didn't live near each other, so there's not a lot of routine things, you know, that, that we shared. But, um, but one of the things um, that was really hard for me was actually entering his house after he passed. And, um, you know, he had a, he lived, his mother lived with him, so the, his mother was still in the house. And, um, and I, I basically had been in touch with her, but hadn't gone there in a number of months. And she finally said, you need to come back to the house. I'm expecting you to come into the house. And so, you know, that started me going back there, but just that routine of driving there and parking in the driveway and walking in the door. I was, I was pretty undone thinking about doing it, but I, I finally did it and visited her many times there and, and it was all okay, but it was, it was not a routine thing that I could continue doing once he wasn't in the house. And I just um, say something, Kathy, I know exactly what you mean. My parents lived, um, well, they were uh, public school teachers. They retired to basically their lake house. And this was an area that we'd been going to my family for 50 plus years. Um, and my dad passed away about three years ago. Um, and he had a chair, you know, it said at the head of the table, as you walked in the back door, he because he could see everything. He could see everybody coming and going. And after he passed, it took me about a year um, for me, able to be, me to be able to sit in that spot, in that chair. I just, I couldn't do it. Um, my mom passed about a year and a half ago and to go back into their home, is, it was, it was tough. And to, the thought of cleaning it out was overwhelming. Um, not only because they weren't there, but they had 70 years worth of, of stuff <laughs> to, to clean out. But um, good news is my younger sister was able to purchase the home. Um, so we still have that. We have their retirement home. We have the part of our family history that's been there for 50 years. So um, it's, it's moving things over a little bit. You know, one thing, um, you know, as dearly as I missed them, I was, um, my grieving was eased a little bit when they, when COVID hit, knowing that they weren't there, um, and they weren't going to be suffering from it. So, um, it's it's all a process. I mean, it's not going away, and my grief is not going away. It never goes away. It just changes. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. And Arlene is sharing a follow up on the grocery store idea. She mentions that Mariano's and Whole Foods. They do have sitting areas where people can sit and eat their food or have a drink. And Mariano's is a grocery store chain in the Chicagoland area. And Mariano's also has music playing on Friday and Saturday evenings. And I suppose Instacart is a option, but I think we, we wanna get back to what feels normal to us. And what strikes me during these conversations is the loneliness of grieving and the loneliness of not being able to have the words to explain why it's tough to go into a grocery store. So for instance, um, Brenda, who couldn't go in the grocery store for a year, she didn't talk about it to anybody. That's lonely. Yeah, it's funny. I, um, I have a dear friend who lost her father about six months after my father passed. And so we're kind we were friends before, but this kind of these experiences so close together really like um, kind of brought us a lot closer together. And she's the one I text when I'm in the grocery store and freaking out about something because I know that she'll understand and I don't have to really like even explain, you know, um, I can just say like, I'm at the store and I hate it here or something. And she's like, yep. And she just, she just knows and understands. And so, yeah, if you don't have that person who is, you know, can relate or, you know, just is there and understands it can be very difficult um, to have those experience and experiences and feel like you have to hold them to yourself with nowhere to, to share them. And this idea that we're all in a different process. So Katie's talking about what it was like for her to see that chair and maybe someone else in the family is like, what's the big deal? Just like Kathy, your experience with that group that splintered because they are in a different process. 
So sometimes it's trying to find the person that understands where you are in the process and doesn't judge it and doesn't say, what are you doing? Just go into the grocery store. What are you doing? Just sit in the chair. But there are some simple movements that are just too much for us because of that grief. So how do we take care of ourselves during these moments when the secondary loss is feeling really powerful? What do you guys think? Um, I think journaling is one thing that like has been helpful for me um, and that was helpful during that time um, and during like writing out some of those emotions and then also like finding space like to be alone to just cry and to like release the tears because I feel like there's so much like of like trying to put on a brave face or a happy face or like a comforting reassuring face for everyone else like not only like my carry and like immediate family but kind of the collective like all of the people who are like worried about us and care about us and praying for us and wanting to know how we're doing and um and I think that that sometimes can take a lot of energy to be kind of like trying to be positive like to everyone else and so I think having those moments to be able to be vulnerable and just like to collapse in like a healthy way and being able to like cry and like is I think is a really powerful release because I think there's so much time where it's like trying not to cry like I remember like I would like not want to cry in front of the doctors at all like so I'd be, be like very stoic in front of the doctors and in front of everyone really like and so having time and space like where I felt like I could just like really like break down and cry alone like was a great release and like after that like I would feel a lot better um so for me like driving in my car and like listening to music like would be you know something that was helpful and like um I think and then I have a couple of friends that I met like through the kind of the caregiving experience at my um, husband's rehab facility and we became close and I know that they understand um, uh, one of them her husband has a traumatic brain injury so it's some different than a spinal cord injury but also a lot in common and so um, those friendships have been really important in addition to um, a couple of close friends who um, are not necessarily in a similar of an experience but in saying that it reminded me that I wanted to say that that rehab community is a huge secondary loss. And so that was a place where we felt we both found a huge sense of community and support um, and healing. And my husband was making physical progress um, through this really um, incredible uh, combination of acupuncture and physical therapy and traditional Chinese medicine. And, um, and, and so that was a place where we were going several times a week. It was a place where we met them actually while my husband was still in the hospital and started going very soon after. Um, and they really provided sort of this space of like stability and love and community. Um, and the staff there are just incredible. And um, the friendships we made with other people who were attending physical therapy and the caregiver partners, like everything about it was just, it's such a special place. And um, like I said, my husband was making a lot of physical improvements. And so we haven't been able to go back since COVID. Um, and prior to that, he had had to take a break from it um, because of a pressure wound and having to have surgery and then recover. And then we went back one time um, post-surgery before COVID hit. And so having that taken away, um, I feel like is a huge loss, both in, both in terms of his physical recovery um, and kind of the impacts on mental health that that can also have. Um, and then for both of us having that community, like a, for him, a peer support community of other people who are in similar situations going into rehab um, and doing this like really intense physical therapy. And then my community with other caregivers who are there supporting their partners or their dads or their you know son or daughter. Um, and then the staff who were just so caring um, and supportive of us and really became like a family for us like during those really traumatic times. Um, so I say that's a huge secondary loss. I think that um, we've kind of had to just cope with and, accept and come to a place of acceptance for now. You know, something that we've kind of alluded to, which is to show up in our life with people who get where we are in our life. And that strikes me as something that was really powerful for you about the rehab facility, Emily, that you both showed up and no one had questions for you other than what can we help you with today? We're here to support you, but it wasn't questions of why are you at this place in your life? It was, you belong here. I guess that's what we're all looking for, especially during losses. 
this feeling of being connected to understanding the sense of belonging. And those losses dis disconnect us from the places or the groups where we once felt like we belonged. And then you have to build up new places where you belong. So there's energy around that. And during a time when you're grieving, how much energy do we have to recreate and build again? That can be a challenge. So there's a couple comments in the chat room. So Janet suggesting that meditation and, you know, I, I know the word and I always say it wrong. Reiki, right? Say it for me, Emily. Reiki. 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 And it's a form of energy healing. I was just putting in the chat. Um, yes, Janet, because I, I practice Reiki also and it's been a big help for me. And someone else has mentioned um, that there are signs that our loved ones who have died are, are still with us. And I'm just curious for um, the three of you, because you've all lost someone really important to you. What signs have appeared to you that have connected you to them after their death? Um, for me, it's um, my dad loved music. Um, he was a musician, not like as a day job, but um, that was like his passion. And he, um, he played music for almost his entire life. And so um, since he's passed, a couple of people have come into my life that I didn't know, you know, before. And, you know, they have a similar passion for music. And so when I get to talk about music with people, I always feel like, like he, he sent those people to me um, to be able to connect with him. So that's one sign that I've seen. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, I always appreciate it. <laughs> Kathy, how about for you? Well, as a friend of mine said to me after the grocery store incident, so why do you think that song came on while you were standing at the grocery store? So, you know, so it's, you know, things like that, that, you know, you can say are signs or not signs, but, you know, why does this song come on when I'm sitting here I, a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was around the holidays. I was really, as I said, having a hard time. I was having a day when all I was doing was crying and I turned on the radio and I was like, there's a significant song, you know? Is it significant because you make it so? Is it significant, you know, who knows why? Who knows why those convergences happen? But um, I feel like if you can find meaning in them, go ahead, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Um, a few months after my mom passed away, I went into a very deep depression, um, was hospitalized and, you know, got through that. Um, and then was making a decision whether or not I wanted to, or could continue working. Um, and there was a day when I was trying to decide um, what I needed to do. And as I'm in the car, I'm thinking, this is it, I need to hand in a resignation. I just need to concentrate on myself and my family. I drove up to um, the building. I worked in a hospital and um, on the top of a hospital is a cross. And I know it was always there. And I looked up and I, you know, I had prayed to my mom and I had prayed to God, you know, please guide me in the direction. And I looked up and the cross was lit up. It's always lit up, but it was the first time that I noticed this cross just shining so brightly. And there was a song that came on that, um, we had played at my mother's funeral called Well Done, um, both at the same time. And I thought, okay, this is, you're guiding me in the right direction as to what I need to do. And it's worked out. <laughs> so yeah, they, I mean, there are songs that come on and I think mom would like the song or, you know, my parents were big band fans and, you know, I'll be in a store and they'll be playing you know, certain music. I'm like, I could see my parents dancing up there and things like that. So, yeah, I love that. And I love giving ourselves permission to know that there is significance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Emily, I wanted to give you a chance to answer if, if you see signs from your uncle. And then I wondered too, I think we'll close with just some insights from you around the salt ritual. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but tell us about any signs that your uncle sends you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think in, um, sometimes just coming across something, um, 
of his. So we actually, we live in the studio that's attached to my parents' house that my uncle um, lived in and he re totally redid um, before he got sick. And so um, we feel very connected to him and very um, grateful for this space and like having this space. And so we have, um, I mean, we have like a painting of him actually that my grandma did years ago on the wall and so like honoring him and um different things like he was a musician also so like his like guitar picks like sometimes I'll find like guitar picks like somewhere still um so those are some reminders and then in general with um not just my uncle but kind of with guides I think um Janet had mentioned like um, I pay attention to numbers a lot. And so I see a lot of like on the clock, like 1111 and 333 and 222 and 444. So um, I pay attention to those numbers and I have a close kind of circle of friends that we like text each other at that time. Um, like if we look at the clock and we see it 333, we send a text of 333. And um, I feel like it, it, for one, it was a way, especially it was something I did before my husband's injury a little bit, but it was something that I did after with certain friends because there were times where like, I couldn't fully reply or text or like the question, like, how are you? was just like too hard to answer. And sometimes like there are no words. <laughs> and so sending numbers was a way to say like, I'm here and I'm okay. And I'm thinking, or I'm thinking of you. And I let, or it's like a way to connect without words. Um, but so, and so now we do it so much like you know, it's almost like a daily occurrence. I at least will get, you know, one. Sometimes I get like 10 different text messages of like a, t a 555 or 1111 at different times of the day. Um, and it's a way like, I feel like um, it sort of like strengthens these connections across time and space um, with people that I may not have a chance to be able to like have a whole conversation with, but I can send that quick text. Um, like I'm thinking of you. Um, and then also um, I have a young person who, um, so I worked with youth and one of um, the young people I worked closely with was murdered six weeks after my husband's injury and I was still in the hospital when his mom called me and that was a really traumatic experience on top of a traumatic experience. Um, but his favorite animals were sloths. He loved sloths because his mom said he was like a sloth because he would like move slow or like would <laughs> like lay on the couch or something. And so, um, so ever since his death, like I see sloths everywhere and a small group of close friends who keep in touch with his mom and we really work to support his mom. Um, we all like will send each other things related to sloths. And so like I have a sloth stuffed animal and um, I went to the grocery on the I will, first time we ever went on a trip after my husband's injury, we went to Tahoe a couple years ago and in the gas station on the way there, there was a bag of sour candy and their sour sloth candy. And I was like, I've never seen that. And that felt like a sign, you know, from him of like, yeah, go have fun on your vacation. And then ever since then, I just see sloths, sloths everywhere, <laughs> like, um, you know, and so they come up all the time um, and we'll text them to each other and stuff. And so it just feels like a reminder from him. Um, and so, yeah, I love, I love seeing sloth signs that come up a lot. And I, I really sloth, the energy of sloth is a reminder to slow down and to relax and to not feel guilty about resting um, and to um, take the time to relax and rest and rejuvenate and take care of ourselves and to not feel guilty about it. So that's a message that it brings for me in those reminders. So we're running tight on time, but I wanted to share an idea for everyone around secondary losses that Emily used with us in our November event. And then we had a special December event. And it is using a, a cup of water and salt. And it basically is to acknowledge a loss by um, using words and then dropping the salt into the water. And then after our November event, Emily went out to her property and released the salt in the water with healing thoughts. So Emily, quickly give us an example of how you could use that ritual of dropping the salt in the water to acknowledge a, a, a secondary loss, something that you're grieving about. Yeah, so I just, I have like, I'll have a small dish of water and then a small little container of salt. Um, and I'll just um, put a pinch of salt. Um, I keep it on my altar and I'll put a pinch of salt and um, for each of the things that I'm grieving or that I want to release. Um, and then I really like floating candles. And so I put a floating candle in the bowl of water and I light it um, and, and just kind of say a prayer over it to, to release that grief. And then I let the candle burn for as long as it burns out over several hours. And 
Um, and then I take the water outside and I pour it back to the earth um, and ask the earth um, to help hold this energy and to transmute this energy. Um, and then also, um, you know, express gratitude for the earth and the trees and the moon and the stars. And actually that you reminded me, Denise, after I took it out last time, I think we did one in December as well, a small ritual. And when I took it out that night um, and poured the water on the ground, um, th there's these big eucalyptus trees in my backyard that surround my house that I feel like are my like ancestor trees. I, I love them deeply. Um, and as soon as I poured the water and said these prayers of release for everyone and for protection and for gratitude, the trees all of a sudden out of nowhere, they started waving and moving. Um, and it wasn't windy at all. It was a really still night, but these trees just started moving. And so I felt like they were acknowledging like everything that I just said and like the water and the prayers and the tears. The salt water also represents tears, like the release of tears and that salt water and tears are medicine. Um, and so that was really powerful. So I'm glad, thanks for reminding me, Denise, so that I could share that because the trees were like waving and dancing and <laughs> let us know that they heard, they heard our the prayers. <laughs> yes, there are signs all around us that we are surrounded by mm -hmm. love and support and receive the signs without question, just receive them. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us today. Special thanks to our panelists, Kathy, Melinda, and Emily. Just a reminder, we'll post this archive on Monday and your email that you'll receive in about 10 minutes will have a link that you can go to on Monday to rewatch any of these videos. And we'll also have the PowerPoints from the first three presentations. Okay, thanks everybody so much for being here. Have a good weekend. Bye.